بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nothing But Facts live stream as we proceed now into episode, I don't know what, 100 and something? 107 on a day in which, subhanAllah, it makes me really just, I was thinking about some other countries how there's not, they may be Muslim countries, but they're not able to do a ton of what we're able to do. And we have to be thankful and grateful. We're just like, it's it's sort of a pastime for people to be haters and to just hate, be negative about everything, whine and complain about everything. I was just joking about with some of the brothers here that the, the pastime of employees is to just be hating on the administration all the time. This is like what they do for fun. Right, um, is to hate on everything. Just whine and complain, and we feel like we rally in unity by whining and complaining. But I was just thinking, like half of this stuff, we wouldn't be able to do in a Muslim country. The biggest ones: Egypt, we get shut down. Syria, of course, he can't even live there anymore. Baghdad, wild, wild east. Iraq is the wild, wild east. All these countries, alhamdulillah. All these countries, you couldn't be able to do this stuff, right? So uh, we have to be grateful. And today we're on the... Uh, what's wrong with the internet here? It's not working on my phone. Something very weird, because I need... Today we are talking about the affairs of the Ummah. And, if I could load it up here, a really... Huh? Yeah, but I, it's you, my, my phone is the only one logged into the New York Times. That's a problem. I don't know why the internet is failing on my phone. All right, let's go to the affairs of the Ummah. And we have some beef in Leicester, England, which I spent about four, maybe three of the four years in England saying Leicester. Okay. And people would say, meet, meet me at Gloucester Road. And I cannot find Gloucester Road for the life of me. And it's Gloucester Road. So there's an extra C. I'm like, I'm looking at the map, bro. There is no Gloucester Road. There's Gloucester Road. Have you heard how they say oregano? What did they say, oregano? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> All right, listen up. There is some beef in the UK. And why does it seem that there is just no peace in the UK? It's like groups are at each other's throats. All the time, the Muslim groups. Now we have the Hindu versus the Muslim. Well, maybe this will unify the Muslims a little bit. So maybe it's actually a blessing uh, in disguise that the Muslims can uh, unify between this a gang of drunken Hindu youth terrorizing the Muslims of Leicester. Uh, so the Hindus and the Chin and the and the uh, Israelis are really like just such animosity. The tension began in May when a 19-year-old Muslim man was attacked with bats and poles by 30 Hindu youths. Again, Wednesday is the affairs of the Ummah. So we read, usually I like to read from 5pillarsuk.com. Okay, it's a good website. Okay, so they're beating up this Muslim guy. And they attacked a man who was trying to protect a victim in his house. So this 19-year-old was beaten so bad he went to the hospital. And it was, of course, reported to the police. But the perpetrators got away. They weren't charged. Then on August 28th, after a India-Pakistan cricket match, a large group of Hindu men marched through the streets in Leicester, chanting death to Pakistan, which led to clashes. A Sikh who was trying to stop the chants was assaulted, as was a local police officer. They assaulted a cop, essentially. Okay. According to locals, according to the locals, two days ago, another Muslim youth, also 19 years old, he was attacked by Hindu men, a gang. And he went out, uh, when he went out to smoke a cigarette late at night. Okay. The incident had happened after another Pakistan-India cricket match. The Muslim was accused of celebrating the Pakistan victory by throwing eggs at people. He was attacked so badly. You want it on? Yeah. Okay. 
he was attacked so badly that he went to the hospital too. And last night, there was a meeting in Leicester about the incidents attended by over 300 people. A town hall. Leicester Town Hall, and there's no white people anymore, right? The British uh, reverse colonization has taken full effect in England, right? 300 people, including the police and local politicians. After the meeting, a group of Muslim men marched through the areas of Leicester to show their presence. You, you want to be honest, it's sort of fun, right? I'd like to be part of this. Clashes and standoffs with the police occurred up until about 11 p.m. Community activist Majid Freeman, he told Five Pillars, something like this has never happened in the area. It's very shocking. These gangs have been causing different types of issues for a long time. Antisocial behavior, such as urinating in the streets and getting drunk and now beating people up, sending them to the hospital. Over cricket matches, they turned it into a third world. That's what they did. No offense, England shouldn't let these people in your country. Muslim women in the area say they're being intimidated by Hindus. And locals feel like the police aren't taking it seriously. Right? They're very frustrated with the police. Muslims and Hindus have been living in peace here for years. They've never had any issues. But this specific group of youngsters are going around getting drunk and beating people up. Here's what comes If they're getting drunk, they must not be getting that drunk, then they wouldn't be able to differentiate between a Muslim and a Hindu, right? I mean, I don't know, know what it's like to be drunk, but I'm assuming when you're drunk, you're not able to actually, you know, take an action that's, that makes, that has any logic to it. So they have a clear logic. They're attacking Muslims, right? Uh, and sending them to the hospital. They've done this many times, so... I don't know. Interesting. I would think that if you get drunk, you don't even know how to do uh, that, basically. You would attack anybody. You would not even successfully attack them. Right? So I guess there's levels of drunkenness. I don't know. So he's saying here, if the police had done their job the first time, they would have nipped it at the bud, but now they know they can get away with it. Okay? They know that they can get away with it. This is a great article by... Yes. Yep, we are. Yeah, we are. He added, the Muslims in the area didn't respond to these provocations because the family of the victim of the attack in May told them they'd gone to the police. So the Muslims didn't react. But the attacks haven't stopped. And these gangs are picking Muslims off by a number when they're 30 and they find one Muslim who's alone then he's no match for them. At the meeting last night, the Muslims made it clear that they have no problem with Hindus. I mean, to be honest with you, that may be the right thing to say, but it's not the effective thing to say. If you want a gang of Hindus are beating you up, you got to sort of show up with a bigger gang, right? You don't may necessarily have to use it, but you don't go to the group that's beating you up and say, hey, we get along. All right. They said, we will not accept our kids getting beaten up. Okay, that's just words. So you need to actually um, come out with a showing of a bigger gang, right? So not always that you, that when you, when you show up with a bigger weapon, it doesn't mean you're going to use it, but you got to show the other person that you have it. And that's usually what scares them away. Five pillars contacted Leicestershire police and they issued the following statement. Yesterday evening, on Monday, the 5th of September, two days ago, we received reports that a number of people were in the area of Cotsmoor Road and that three people had suffered injuries that were not life-threatening or life-changing. One person suffered a stab wound on their hand. Oh, that's pretty bad. What if he was a surgeon? A full and robust investigation is underway. Our message is clear. We have zero-tolerance approach. We have a zero-tolerance approach to violence. We're saddened that these incidents have occurred and we understand this is all political speak by the way it's not going to get anything done what's going to get anything done is a bigger gang on the street right. this is just very good for for showing like the the whites the the british government that you're behaving properly but that's not what's going to get things done it is our aim to de-escalate tensions 
again, political words. In addition, we are working closely with community leaders and trying to provide reassurance and prevent inadvertent misinformation spreading in the community. We have taken extensive action this week, all right, as we were aware of community tensions that resulted from disorder after the Asia Cup cricket match. There was an incident in the area of Melton Road and Shaftesbury Avenue after this match where an Indian supporter was assaulted by other India supporters. Okay. So it looks like they got the wrong guy. Anyway, a video of this has been circulating on social media. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see it. Police have been taking a preventative stance, investigating, keeping an open dialogue. This is nonsense. A man who was arrested in connection with this incident was later released under investigation. Further, at 1.45 a.m. last Monday, just Monday that passed, a man was assaulted near to a Bridge Road in East Leicester. At this time, the victim is considering the options of engaging with the police, but we have continued to work with him and talk to him about what happened. So Muslims, you don't have like a bunch of big dudes put on like a, a certain t-shirt that's a certain color, right? And all will just walk around the streets. I don't know if it's allowed to carry around a cricket bat, right? You know, that's what I would do. Walk around with a cricket, just walk around the streets. Big bunch of dudes, security. Uh, there was a guy I picked up on the street and well, some of them, my kids think it's crazy, but when I see people walking on the streets on the summer day or something, I pick them up. I give them a ride, right? I usually make them sit next to me so that they can't, it's safer if he sits next to you. Because you, if you watch all the mob movies, someone sits behind you, that's dangerous. You can just put a thing around your neck. So you know about that. In the mob movies, that's how the, the mafia, they kill everybody. So the guy sits next to me. We chit-chat. He turns out he's a security. He works security. Right, I told him to come to the soup kitchen. His name is Romeo. He's 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 a security guard. Right, I had some fruit with me. I gave him some fruit, and we became like acquaintances. He was really like shocked. I gave him a ride. He was really happy. He was about to walk six miles. I gave him a ride. It took me two minutes. Right, we became friends. Anytime we need security, we got him. We got Abdul Latif. We got even Mohammed Algerian. See, Louis. Which one? Oh, Lewis, yes, yes. Except Lewis is going to come in like some kind of Versace and he's not going to want to get it dirty, right? That's his problem, right? But uh, he's like, I don't want to get my sneakers dirty. But this guy, um, security, you always have to have physical security on site. All this talk is nonsense, okay? In my opinion, my personal opinion, you, you still have to do it for the sake of just like, for the sake of doing it. Uh, politically being political about it but the real way that you're going to be effective if it's something on the streets is the solution is going to be on the streets right not in the halls of politics and the newspapers all right we are keen to avoid further incidents but should they occur officers may use dispersal powers under section 34 of the Anti-Social Behavior Act okay, of 2014. Failing to comply with an order is a criminal offense and police can return anyone under the age of 16 to their home address. Notices can be issued. Okay. I'm telling you, we, you got to hunt down this gang. All right, You got to hunt them down and send one of them to the hospital. Break an ankle. What's wrong with that? Right? It's not overreacting. It's not violence. All right? It's just one ankle. Not a big deal. That's it. That's how it's going to... Um... All right? So uh, the Hindus have responded to Five Pillars UK. Okay? It's not advocating violence. It's not advocating. But if you are someone who is attacking someone and you respond... You have the right by law and by Sharia. All right? That's what I'm saying. We're not saying that uh, you go out there and you find an innocent person to attack. No. All right. So, Baharti Mohit Sandilya from India is saying, this is all fake news. It is you Muslims terrorizing the Hindus instead. 
All right, let's see what else Five Pillars got. Very interesting story. By the way, we have another story that I'm going to read to you about war in America. But it is not a war between people. It's a war between a rancher and the local beavers. And really, honestly, it's as beautiful. It's the, the miracle of the beaver. One of Allah's creation. Yeah, and you have to. You cannot see this, read this, learn this knowledge about the beaver and then go on becoming a, a, a believing that this came up from nothing. It must have come from a knowledgeable creator when you read this. But let's see if there's any more juicy stuff. All right, Liz Truss is the new Prime Minister of England, and there's only one piece of thing that's important here, is that uh, she wants strong ties with Turkey. So I think that's good for Turkey, right? It's good for Turkey that the UK wants strong ties. That's the only thing we're going to say about that, because otherwise it's just internal uh, politics. But that's the new Prime Minister of Turkey, and that fool, Boris Johnson, it has been replaced, okay? Unceremoniously dismissed and kicked to the curb like a dog. Phosis warns, Phosis is our version of the MSA, uh, sorry, the British version of what we call the MSA. They call it the Federation of Islamic Soci um, Students Islamic Society. The Federation of Students Islamic Societies. So we call MSA, they call it in England Islamic Societies. And, they, and the, the, the umbrella group is called Phosis. Okay? It warns, all right, it may tell Muslim students to withdraw from the NUS, which is the National Union of Students, over Islamophobia concerns. So namely, the National Union of Students is essentially, I guess, um, against Muslims. And so Phosis is saying, well, we're going to pull out of this. So, well, let's see what they have to say, because as, I don't know, for, for those j just joining, um, Wednesdays is for the affairs of the Muslims. We don't have a Muslim uh, paper for news in America, right? It would be all pretty much like pathetic news anyway. But um, the British have all sorts of news here. All right, so FOSIS represents Islamic societies, student groups, basically. And it has said it will encourage its affiliates to withdraw from the National Union of Students unless it supports the new president, Shayma Dalila, or Dalali, and addresses the institutional Islamophobia and racism within the organization. See, I don't think that American Muslims would ever do something like this. We would just bend over backwards. We keep bending. We love to bend over and just uh, have really very... I don't know. I never see strong stances coming out of... Um, and by the way, when I say strong stances, it doesn't always mean you're always going to like uh, follow through with it. Sometimes you just have to uh, uh, carry a big stick like uh, one of the American presidents said. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it. So the statement came as the NUS president, Shema Dalali. Shema is the uh, wet sister from wet nursing of the Prophet That's why Muslims named that name, Shema. She was suspended for anti-Semitism, okay? The first time in the Union's 100-year history that a president has been suspended. Why was she suspended? Oh, this is an interesting story, right? Because there was an inquiry which looked into allegations against her, okay? The NUS board members reportedly been told that her suspension would not be seen as punitive or disciplinary measure. That's a bunch of nonsense. What is a suspension that's not disciplinary measure? But what's the reason she got suspended? Okay. In a statement published yesterday, Fosa said it stands in solidarity with Delali, who has faced multiple, who has faced multiple Islamophobic and racist attacks since being the overwhelmingly elected all right, president of this national organization. The NUS, its representative body of students across the educational sphere, needs to uphold the democratic mandate given to Shema and not undermine her position. It also needs to address this institutionalized Islamophobia and racism within the organization to send a message to Muslim students that it cares about the protection of their rights. So what did she do? Okay, We are deeply concerned with NUS negligence in communication 
the investigation to date, we have not been contacted or consulted regarding this matter. What did she do? Okay. For many years, FOSIS has dealt with troubling cases of Islamophobia experienced by the different Islamic societies, Muslim sabbatical officers, and the wider Muslim community, blah, blah, blah. The active targeting of Muslim students through a systemic pattern, you know, these words bother me, systemic, whatever, these are all type of uh, uh, woke activist type of words. Anyway, but let's see what they're saying. What did she actually do that got her suspended? Right? If significant steps aren't taken towards the following actions, working with FOSIS to conduct an investigation into the Islamophobia in the NUS, and working with FOSIS to bring an external body to conduct an investigation on how they handled Shemet's uh, case, in other words, an arbitrator, external arbitrator. 130,000 Muslim students are part of this body. Okay? Five Pillars has contacted the NUS for comment and is awaiting a reply. In May, the government cut ties with NUS over concerns of anti-Semitism after Jewish students took offense to a 2012 tweet. Like 10 years ago. She wrote, Khaybar, Khaybar, Ya Yahud, Muhammad's army will return to Gaza. I like this sister. It's a good president. The 27-year-old has since apologized for the tweet. I don't like her so much anymore. Don't apologize. She's saying she's now a different person. Don't apologize. What would you apologize for that? Either tweet it or don't tweet it, but don't apologize. Anyway, maybe she had to for the sake of her job or something. The then educate, but but actually, what is wrong with it? Is Gaza not an oppressed area of land? So why would you apologize for that? I would rather stick with that if I'm going to say it at all. I'll stick my to my guns and not become NUS president. Anyway, maybe she couldn't get a job or something. But you can't blame 25-year-old, 27-year-old because they're still forming and they haven't realized the importance of... And they may be buckle under pressure or something. You can't blame them for that. The then Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, said he was seriously concerned at the number of reports of alleged anti-Semitism linked. Of course, anti-Semitism from what they call anti-Semitism to us is a political stance, Right? that Gaza deserves justice, you are oppressors in Gaza, we are against your oppression. And you, because you identify with your oppression. You're not oppressing accidentally. You're not oppressing and then feeling guilty about it. You've taken your identity as your act. Your act of oppression of the Palestinians is, you're you're proud of it. You've mingled it with your identity. So we're against your oppression, which means we're also against you. He added, Jewish students need to have confidence that this is a body that represents them. It represents them. It has to stand. Uh, so they've really merged the two things. That's the you can't get out of it. They've merged it, all right. In the same way that LGBT has merged it with the identity of uh, supporting them, and uh, or if you don't support this thing, whatever, then you hate. You're full of hate, and you're the reason we're committing suicide. Jews are the same thing. Oh, if you're against Israel's actions, uh, you're against Jews, and you're basically a Nazi. NUS, so they, they, this is like a persuasion, political uh, concoction that handcuffs anybody from speaking out. An NUS spokesman said, we cannot comment at this time as we are in the middle of an independent QC-led investigation into allegations of anti-Semitism. Um, but as we have said before, we are prepared to take any and all actions recommended, which is, again, some political talk, blah, blah, blah. All right, so... That was an interesting case. And um, of course, Muslims in England, their numbers are so high. They actually can throw around some weight, so they should. But when you're going against the Yahud, it's going to be a tough battle. File seen by next story Shamima Begum smuggled into Syria by a Canadian intelligence agent. Really interesting. I'm reading this because this is not the Ummah's news. This is like one person's news, but it's an interesting story. It is widely reported by the media that Shamima Bega was smuggled into Syria by an intelligence agent for Canada. This is a bizarre story. 
Files seen by the BBC and others show that an agent, Muhammad Al Rashid, he claimed to have shared Miss Begum's passport details with Canada and smuggled other Britons over to fight for ISIS. Miss Begum was 15, and she and two other East London schoolgirls, Qadiza Sultana and Amir Abbasi, they traveled to Egypt, uh, to Syria in 2015 to fight with ISIS. At the main Istanbul bus station, the girls met a Rashid who facilitated their journey to ISIS-controlled Syria. A senior intelligence officer has confirmed to the BBC that Rashid was providing information to Canadian intelligence while smuggling people to ISIS. So that means he's a double agent? Is that what they're saying? The BBC has obtained a dossier, a dossier on Rashid that contains information gathered by law enforcement intelligence as well as material recovered from his hard drives. He told authorities he had gathered information on the people he helped into Syria because he was passing it on to the Canadian embassy in Jordan. The dossier shows that Ms. Begum was moved to Syria through a substantial ISIS people smuggling network controlled from Raqqa. Rashid was in charge of the Turkish side of this network, and he facilitated the travel of Britishers, British men and women, to ISIS. Tasneem Akunji, the lawyer of the Begum family, said there will be a legal hearing in November to challenge the removal of Miss Begum's citizenship, and one of the main arguments will be that then Home Secretary Sajid Javid did not consider that she was a victim of trafficking. The UK has international obligations as to how we view a trafficked person. Okay. Now her lawyer says it's shocking that a Canadian intelligence asset is part of this. Okay. Someone who was supposed to be an ally, protecting our people. Rather, he trafficked British citizens. So is he a double agent or what? Intelligence gathering looks to have been prioritized over the lives of children. Shamima Begum is now held in a detention camp in northeast Syria, and her citizenship has been taken away. A Canadian security uh, intelligence service spokesman said he could not publicly comment on or confirm or deny the specifics of this investigation. A British government spokesperson said, is our long-standing policy, we don't comment on security matters. Very interesting story. All right, let's read a very interesting situation about the miracle of the beavers. Well, this is not exactly affairs of the Ummah, as we had promised, but we read three stories. Just to, It gives us a snippet of what's going on in our Ummah, even if they're individual stories. Not everything has to be like uh, worldwide, like, for example, Ummah-wide news, but... This is reminding me of, like, you're watching local news, yeah, and they're talking about like murders, and then they're talking about crimes and everything, and then they yep. go to like a Groundhog Day. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, hey, we we got three stories, but we got four slots to fill, right? What do we? What do you guys got? Uh, let's uh, just take this feel-good story about a beaver. Uh, let's take this this health. Uh, anytime they give you like a health report, that means there's no other news, essentially. And if it's a medicine that came out, then the, the news companies tend to be uh, working with these pharmaceuticals to get the word out. But listen to this. It was war. Okay? A rancher had a problem with the local beavers that kept making dams. And this guy kept bombing the dams with dynamite. Okay? And now he has made truce. So listen to this. Horace Smith blew up a lot of beaver dams over the last 10 years. He's a rancher in northeast Nevada. Firstly, I don't even know you can grow anything in northeast Nevada, okay, because it's so dry. He waged war against the animals, bombing their, uh, their dams with dynamite, killing many. Not from meanness or cruelty. It was a struggle over water. Mr. Smith blamed beavers for flooding parts of his property okay they build a they build a dam and it floods his property okay uh his son agi eventually took over the ranch and he started to observe some of the benefits of these dams so he made peace okay and he is now welcoming beavers to build as they do okay 
They are very controversial, the, the beavers, uh, Mr. Smith said. But it's getting better, and people are starting to wake up to the brilliance of the beaver. It's Allah's creation. This is what we're talking about right now, Allah's creation. As global warming intensifies droughts, floods, and wildfire, Mr. Smith has become one of a growing number of ranchers, scientists, and other beaver believers, quote-unquote, right, who see the creatures not only as helpers, but as weapons of climate resilience. Last year, when Nevada suffered one of the worst droughts on record, it was only beaver pools that kept his cattle alive with enough water. So if, he had not, if the beavers had not made these dams that would store up the water, all of his cows would have died. That's the year in which Mr. Smith realized these guys are our allies. Now clearly Allah has sent these people. See, the, the, the beaver is not a pest. Now the raccoon's a pest. Rats are pests. But a beaver, anything that acts, you know, usually they act open in the daylight, is not a pest, right? So beavers are out there acting in the daytime. Raccoons, rats, these guys are, they're, they're in the nighttime. So they're pests, right? They do damage to your property. But the beaver is acting in the daytime. Usually what it's going to do is something good for you. And when, if they're doing that, why don't you build your, your farm around that in the sense that like benefit from the free labor that you're getting. When rains came strangely hard and fast, the vast network of dams slowed a torrent of water raging down from the mountain, and it protected his hay crop. That was the second benefit he realized that came from the dams. And with the beaver's help, creeks have widened into wetlands that run through the desert, cleaning water, birthing new meadows, and creating a buffer against wildfires. Truly, beavers can be complicated partners. They're wild. They swim. All right? They are rodents. Okay? They're the size of, they can grow to become the size of small dogs. And they are obsessed with building dams. If there is a conflict between us and the beavers, you can't talk it out. Beavers' dams have some side effects. They flood roads. They flood fields. The timber forests and other areas that people want dry become wet. They cause trees to fall without a thought. that They bite and they chop away. And maybe humans wanted those trees there. So in response to the complaints earlier, okay, the federal government came in. This is what goes on in Nevada. The federal government came in last year and killed 25,000 beavers. So that's what's going on. It seems like an Owen Wilson movie or something, right? <laughs> you know, that the government coming in, what are you doing? Well, we're going to bomb beavers, okay? 25,000 beavers were killed by the federal government, okay? We don't know this stuff in, in the city, but this is what goes on way out west in the United States. But beavers, they also store lots of water for free. And this is becoming a crucial a factor in the parched west because if you're in england out there or you're not aware of what's going on the west has severe droughts which is calling severe wildfires all throughout california and nevada is a bordering city state to california they don't just help with droughts droughts is the one thing they help with but they subdue torrential floods when the rain or the snow melt comes in heavy rains Okay, the, the rain comes down heavier than usual. The dams is what's helping stop the flooding. It reduces erosion and recharges groundwater. And the wetlands beavers create have extra benefits of stashing kyber, uh, f uh, carbon. In addition to that, okay, it stops forest fires. Because the beavers made the lands wet, it protects from forest fires. This is a brilliant creation of Allah Ta'ala. In addition to all that, the rodents do environmental double duty because they also tackle another crisis unleashed by humans. Rampant biodiversity loss. Their wetlands are increasingly recognized for creating habitats for different species. So now, we have grouse, we have salmon coming into the land, right? Because beavers created uh, wetlands. Beavers, you might say, are having their moment. This is the, the, the author is like really having fun writing this article. 
In Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, and Wyoming, the Bureau of Land Management is working with partners to build beaver-like dams that they hope real beavers will claim and expand. In California, the new state budget designated about $1.5 million a year to restoring the animals, the beaver, for climate resilience and biodiversity benefits. So they're basically going to bring in some beavers. We need to get beavers back to work, said California's Secretary of Natural Resources. Okay. Mark my word, they're gonna, someone's going to read this. There's going to be a Disney, there's going to be a Pixar script about the beavers. And it's going to have a character, like a farmer, that goes to war with the beavers, and then they make peace. All right, they'll make it a comedy like, um, what was that one? Um, where the pets, uh, it's like the, the pets in each, in the cities and in the apartments. Zootopia is one of them. Like, you know, these kids' movies where they have uh, the pets talk, the animals talk. They're going to make a movie about this. Full employment for beavers, also known as beaver believers. Okay. And they like to note that the animals work for free. Further east, let's just wait till the activists come in and get ridiculous about this, the animal rights activists. Further east, where what, and they're going to say exploitation. Uh, water and beavers are more plentiful in the east. So the job market isn't as hot, right, for the beaver. Right, we have plenty of water out here east, in the con- east of the country. Out west, it's more dry. In Maryland, there are groups trying to lure beavers to help clean the water that flows into the Chesapeake Bay. In Wisconsin, they're trying to bring out beavers to reduce flooding, right, in the vulnerable areas of Milwaukee. All right, Miss Milwaukee is one of the big cities of Wisconsin. Instead of killing beavers, the federal government should be embracing them as an important component of federal climate adaptation, according to two scientists who study beavers and hydrology. That's what you do all day. (laughs) It may seem trite to say that beavers are a key part of the National Climate Action Plan, but the reality is they're a force of 15 to 40 million highly skilled environmental engineers, said Dr. Jordan and Dr. Fairfax in a prospective article in the research journal Wire. Okay, And it's got a hyperlink as if someone's going to actually click it and read it. Dr. Fairfax's recent search focuses on how beaver compl- complexes interact with wildfires. In other words, the beaver may be the source of a solution for the western wildfires because they're going to stop water and it's going to wet the forests and the woods. For now, her findings indicate that, th- that the beavers have succeeded. The woods are too wet to burn because of the dams created by the beavers. All right, amazing. But as climate change makes wildfire more intense, she said that could change. We cannot afford to work against them any longer. We need the beavers. I can't... <laughs> it's like a Disney movie. All right, Caroline Nash, a river scientist at the consulting firm CK Blue Shift LLC, has published research on, I mean, it's a very fancy, very cool name. It's as if some kind of like hip brand, CK Blue Shift. What are they? Beaver-related restoration projects. That's the company, all right? And they need to be, they go around identifying where the beaver can help. It's all about identifying the locations where the beaver's survival interests align with the human survival interests, okay? Now, he, Dr. Nash said they don't always align. So to suggest that they're always going to be aligned is creating a recipe for false hopes and broken expectations and loss of trust. What, did we have a relationship with the beaver? All right. If it's useful, it's useful. It's not useful, it's not useful. Before Europeans, have anyone ever eat the beaver? Right? Does anyone eat beaver? Uh, before Europeans arrived in North America, beaver's engineering helped to shape the landscape and hydrology of the continent from coast to coast, but their fur was also very popular for the famous felted hats, all right? And trappers had nearly eradicated them by trapping them Killing them just for the fur. Isn't, don't we have a character in American history where the guy wears the beaver fur cap? Right? 
As their numbers climb back, because this uh, trapping was made illegal, and the fur wearing such furs became looked down upon, all right, their numbers climbed back, okay, about a century ago. Now, with that came many conflicts with the humans, even in places where the beaver is honored as a state animal. Right? any guesses where the beaver is a state animal? Uh, I'm thinking Canada. Like, mm. Because when I look up these dishes, mm -hmm. the beaver, barbecue beaver. Oh, they eat it, huh? Beaver tail soup. Well, you got it right. It's very healthy, apparently. You got it right. Canada, the national animal of Canada is the beaver. Okay, or a national symbol, they said. Of course, the maple leaf is one, and the maple syrup is a big deal. Uh, and then the beaver. And then uh, in the United States, it's New York and Oregon. They consider the beaver to be a national animal there. Uh, isn't the Oregon, aren't they called the beavers? Like the Oregon University? No, the, ducks. the ducks. Okay, well, I got my, my lake animals confused. Beavers build dams with logs, sticks, stones, and mud. It's amazing how they build dams, right? To create deeper water wells, okay, which help them dodge predators like bears. So by building a dam, they could go under it and they could dodge the bear, avoid the bear. Their lodges have underwater entrances and they stockpile food below the surface for winter. Their front teeth are orange from the iron that strengthens them from gnawing trees. After they gnaw trees, all right, they get stronger. Yeah. Really? All over the place. Wow. So they have a lot of, their teeth are very special, and it helps them gnaw away at the trees, which when they do that, their teeth even get sharper. When human beaver conflicts arise, they can be addressed without killing the animals, experts say. Paint and fencing can protect trees from gnawing. Am I going to go building fences everywhere? Systems like the beaver deceiver secretly undo their handiwork with pipes that drain water. Oh, okay, so now there's a company called the Beaver Deceiver, right? It's a product now. This is the first time this product has gotten any attention. Um, so you, it's a pump that siphons water outside of their, their dams, basically. It drains water from out of their settlements. Even if the beaver kept digging, the pipe will drain the water outside of their settlement. Okay, and this is more effective than killing the animals, say animal rights activists, because the new beaver tend to move into empty habitats. All right, that's, that makes sense. You bomb some beavers, new beavers would move in. If coexistence is impossible, okay, then a growing number of groups and private businesses are seeking to relocate rather than kill the nuisance beavers. We put the nuisance in air quotes, says Molly Alves, a wildlife biologist uh, with the Tulala tribes, a federally recognized tribal organization south of Seattle. It moves unwanted beavers to land managed by the United States Forest Service. The group's impetus was a desire to expand the extraordinary habitat that beavers off offer salmon, a culturally and economically important species. When they started in 2004, Tulalip tribes had to invoke their sovereign treaty rights to relocate beavers because doing so was illegal in Washington, Washington state. They lobbied for the push. Imagine that. Hey, Mr. Senator. We need, a, we have a beaver bill. Uh, beaver relocation is now legal statewide. One lesson learned, keep beaver families together. They're much more likely to stay where we put them if the whole family is there. Beavers tend to form a really tight-knit familial bonds. You know, in the Sharia, we're, this is recommended to do this, to try to coexist with these animals, right? But in many states, it's illegal to relocate beavers, and other wildlife, in part because officials worry about people simply moving the problem elsewhere. Okay, I'm not interested in all this stuff. The miracle of the beaver, the wonder of what they did, and how they created wetlands in dry areas that stopped forest fires, and how in times of drought, their pools allowed the cows to drink, and how in flood times, it was the dams that stopped the floods. That, to me, is the point of why we're reading this, because it's like one of the ni'am, uh, of understanding the, the, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is just, um, you'll never stop learning. And to take on nature as an enemy is, is not a smart thing. 
and I, you, you started to try to understand actually the uh, the wisdom of the Native Americans, where they actually nature is a very strong force. So work with it rather than trying to work against it, rather than trying to uh, uh, fight it. You can't fight it. It's too big for you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have some announcements for ArcView. Sign up now for ArcView Basic. We are now offering Hanbali Fiqh. Okay? We are now offering, for the, for, for the first time I, I, for, for us, we are offering all four madhabs. All right? MashaAllah. We are offering all four methods. Monday is Hanafi Day. Tuesday, Sh- Maliki Day. Sh- Wednesday, Shafi's. Uh, Thursdays, Hanabila. All right? So sign up at arcview.org. We are still redoing the whole website, but you could still sign up. All right? We're redoing the whole website. You are just going to love the new arcview.org. It's going to give you so much information about all the classes, and this, the system is very simple. All right? There are four parts to the system, all right? ArcView Basic and ArcView Scholarship Track. If you're just starting out, you take Basic. If you're like, okay, I started out, but now I'm ready for heavy-duty classes, you go to Scholarship. The types of classes are virtual or pre-recorded. Virtual means it's live, but it's online. All right, so that's four boxes you got. Virtual, pre-recorded, Basic, and Scholarship. When you sign up, you will get a Zoom link and a calendar. If the class says that it's move, it's happening on this date, boom, click the Zoom link and the Sheikh will be there to teach you. If it's a pre-recorded class, you go to our portal, myarcview.org, and you can watch all the classes at your own pace. More information will be coming slowly about this as we develop and, and revamp the website. And I saw some of the renderings of the revamp it looks, it's, you're going to be able to learn so much about what's going on. Sister Hala and Mu'in, these are the two people who are covering the youth classes. Youth classes will start from Sunday 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. Hala first, and then Mu'in with Sira. Now let's talk about another thing, Aqidah. There are two tracks in Aqidah this year. The first track, Arc View Basic, Muraj Uthman will be teaching the basic texts of Aqidah throughout the year. Okay? Tahawi, Nasafi, different texts like that. So you will study that with him. On Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings, for those who have advanced, you can now study Jawharat at Tawheed. This is like the best pinnacle work, one of, of course, and the most famous of the in depth works on. Aqidah, all right, and that will be taught by Sheikh Osama Salhiya. He's a Palestinian of an Imam in North Jersey. He's a Sheikh. He studied ten years in Al Azhar. He memorized the Quran and multiple Qiraat. Shafi'i fiqh inside and out. Aqidah inside and out, and he is one of the most humble, best people that you will ever interact with, Sheikh Osama Salhiya. Okay, and he is. We have the honor to have him teaching. Jawharat at Tawheed with us. That is on ArcView scholarship track. All right, so go to arcview.org. You're going to immediately be redirected for the time being to the portal, and you could sign up there. ArcView basic, ArcView scholarship track. All right, and um, hey, right, go into ArcView right now, see what it looks like. If you go to arcview.org or my ArcView. All right, you're in. Okay, good. Now click on one of them, either one of them. No, no, not that one. Click on either one of them. Go down. All the way down. You got all the... Where is the sign-up? How are people signing up? Oh, where did you see... Where did you click on for it to get that? All courses. All courses. Okay, so we got to change that because it's not clear where people sign up. Okay? So sign up for ArcView Basic or ArcView Scholarship Track. Okay. And I am also teaching the work of Habib Omar on Mahiyat at Tasawwuf wa Simati Ahli. I'm teaching the what is Islamic spirituality by Habib Omar, and then we will, uh, and that is on Thursday nights, uh, Arc View. Then we will study Sheikh Ahmed uh, Zarruq, or they, uh, as he's known, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, 
قواعد التصوف the rules uh, and the principles of this subject matter or, uh, which is the subject of tasawuf so that's what we will be studying so we have a lot it's, it's uh, this is going to be one of our crispest and best semesters everything will be so simple just can't wait to get uh, the new website up and running all right, right. You're going to read to me from, uh, inshallah, YouTube, and I'll read from Instagram because for some reason my phone is not loading uh, YouTube today. For some reason, I don't know what's going on. But what do we got? What's our brother uh, Eunice's last day before he's got to go back to NUI? No way. Eunice is going to school, no, so there's no sneaking in an earbud, huh? <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble if uh, suggesting that with the uh, with your. Your teachers, who we all know, because it's a community school here. Sheikh Murad. <laughs> Sheikh Murad is his teacher. So you guys know that we have a community school here. New Orleans Man School uh, is next is eight miles from us, and is on the same property as one of the biggest, uh, the biggest masjid in the area. Us MBIC, we're we actually have a bigger musalla, and we have a gym, but we're a smaller property, and we're not even where it's like a rented space. Right, a small rented space, but it's a very big uh, musalla, and we have a big gym. Eight miles south of us is the Nurli Man School. Sheikh Murad teaches there. All right, he teaches aqidah there, and uh, Yunus attends that school. So uh, their official method is Hanafi. They have an official method now, which is very good. Uh, Hanafi, and a lot of our, some of our uh, Safina Society Quran teachers teach there now. Okay. Not everyone in Safina Saadi attends that school. Some of them are homeschoolers. Some of them just go to regular school. But a lot of the community goes to that school. So uh, that's why there's a lot of... If you come, you can go to that school. You can sign up for tuition assistance if you need. All right, let's go to Instagram. Darul Hamdiya is here. Al Madrasa Al Hambaliya is here. Marhaban Bikum. Okay, we are teaching Hambadi Fit at arcview.org for the first time. Okay. MN Tariq is here. All right, what else we got, Ryan? Um, is it permissible to be buried in a non Muslim cemetery if a Muslim cemetery is very far from where you live? No. No, because there's harm there. It's a place of Adab. You don't get buried in a pagan graveyard. I mean, how far are we talking? How far are we talking? An hour? You're only going to make the trip once in your life, unless you want to visit the person. But no. No. You're not bury Muslim with a, with the, in a pagan graveyard. Hijabi Poet is here. Uh, existence of Islam, Mustafa Sayyid. They're all here. Strangest 14. What else you got, Ryan? When a Muslim dies, people visit the homes of his loved ones and bring food and talk about the deceased. Is this allowed? Yes, it's allowed. It's allowed. You are the concept of visitation of the uh, is called aza, and you do this for three days. You bring them food. You make life easier for them. Um, you talk about the good things about the deceased in the hope of giving them uh, belief in Allah's mercy. Prophet himself said, mention the good deeds of your dead. People have hope in his mercy. Next, Ryan. Okay, this is a uh, sponsored question. It's five bucks behind this one. Okay. How to use powerful words when delivering Islamic message. I see a lot of Muslims when talking about deen, they use weak language, and this looks weak. Are you talking, powerful words about the Islamic message, are you talking about dawah? Or Muslim situations like what we just read here in England, and they write a press release. Oh, we're disappointed. Blah blah blah. Okay, I would much rather see a statement. Hindu gang, you don't have to run. We know where you are. We're coming to get you. Okay. Keep an eye over your look over your shoulders because we're coming. Is that the type of powerful speech? I would much rather read that kind of statement. Right. Then, I think you're talking about Dawa, though. You're talking about Dawa, okay. What did, powerful words. I think powerful words, an example of powerful words and powerful language could be, for example, 
when you speak of Islam, you speak of the truth. Not the Islamic viewpoint of something, as if it's a view amongst many, right? You ever see this uh, when people talk? It's like, well, the Islamic view of this, it's okay, but is it a view or is it like the truth of the matter, right? So sometimes you may have to like speak in this conciliatory type of language. Oh, well, our viewpoint is this. But if you want to speak with power, you say, the reality of the situation is this. This is the truth, right? Okay. So uh, I think that's what he's talking about, right? So that's the perspective. Are we speaking about Islam as a set of opinions, views? Well, that gives us the impression that it could possibly be right, possibly be wrong, or that it's just someone's opinion. Whereas when you speak of it as the truth, number one, that is, that's how it's referred to in the heavens, right? You think in the heavens they're saying, uh, yeah, Jibreel, what's our opinion about this? No, what is the truth about this matter, right? They only speak truth in the heavens. And we believe Islam is from, is, is, is uh, you know, reflective of the truth of the heavens. So we should speak about it as the truth. Discussion over. This is al-haq, discussion over. Okay, so uh, that's, you want to speak about power and pers- uh, you speak about that. When you speak about da'wah, when you give da'wah, you best give da'wah in the form of a story. That is the best way to give da'wah. In the form of a story. All right. It grabs people. You want to hone in on the main character of the story with as much detail as possible. Because that's what's going to grab people and they're going to empathize and sympathize with the, the person behind that. Right? And they're going to want to follow along. That's essentially what we're talking about. When you're talking about power, that's what you're talking about. Um, it's a powerful way to grab people by going with a story, an individual story. I hope that answers the question. Hello, White. What should I do about a very close relative who has posted an old and new family picture on Instagram? I was not wearing hijab in the picture and he refuses to remove it or blur it out. No, that's no good. That's an act of war. It's a very, very close family member. Obviously, he's not that close if he doesn't care about you. Maybe he's close by blood, but... I reported the picture and now Instagram has blocked me from their account. Report him too. Call his mom if he's young. Does anyone know how to remove the report? It is, po- uh, I don't know, but um, make a fake account, make a secondary account, and then go look from there. Or you can look at his account when you're logged off. Log out of Instagram, all right, on your laptop. Log out, and then type in Instagram.com backslash his name. And by the way, I've gotten feedback on that. That I've been saying backslash the entire time, it's actually a forward slash. I didn't know that. Did you know that, Ryan? Forward slash leans this way. Backslash leans that way. Yeah, so it's forward slash. Is it possible for women, says Strangest 14, to follow male sunnahs like applying olive oil on one's hair? I believe that is a sunnah for males and females, too. Nothing separating that to be only for males. If Allah reveals someone's sins to others, that means the person was unveiled. That is, is it a punishment or a humiliation to that person? It depends how he receives it, how the person receives it. If he receives it by throwing tantrums and throwing fits and blaming everybody, it's a punishment. And going deeper into his sin and just lying and defending himself, it's a punishment. If he puts his head down, then it's... It is a correction. It's a severe... If he puts his head down and he makes toba, yes, it's a severe correction. It's a shame that it reached that level, but it will be for his benefit. If he puts his head down, admits his defeat, I'm wrong, and he goes and he makes toba, but it is to a degree a punishment because he has um, also lost a lot. Lost a lot of respect from people. Lost a lot of his dignity in front of people. So that is a problem too. 
does Islam say anything about Native Americans? Well, Yasin Archuleta's here, and he knows a lot about Native Americans, if if I'm not mistaken, because his father lives out in New Mexico. If I'm if I got the right Yasin, I don't know how many Archuletas there are in the world that are Muslim. But you should ask him. But the Native Americans, to me, I remember reading that they have a concept called the straight path. And that the Cherokee Indians had interacted with Muslims from Africa and that Tawheed was found in their, their lore, like whatever's remnant of their, uh, of their writings, okay, that Tawheed was found there. And I found that to be pretty amazing. Yassin says, we're also native. They're uh, Ute. Okay? I find that to be pretty amazing. That there is remnants of Tawheed and they had met. And I find the Native Americans that I believe that there are, cer- there are certain themes around across them that may have come from the wisdoms of prophethood. That their Sharia, and Allah, just total speculation, okay? that it may have been that their Sharia, their sacred law, was to live around nature and not to domineer over it because isn't that a theme that you see all across with Native Americans they if, if the stream goes this way you live or you bend with the stream with, with nature you don't try to control it whereas the European culture was control nature I think the Islamic culture was a little bit in between because if you look at the old cities of the Islamic culture all the streets they would make a straight a street straight that was the goal, but if they couldn't because the mountain was too big, they didn't have the technology to do that, they would just wind around it. So they live with nature, in a sense. Right? We also have in our Sharia, you can't demolish a building without emptying it out first. You must, by obligation, empty it out from stray dogs that are sleeping there, cats. Even, I think Asiyuti has an epistle on this, where he mentions you have to take the nests of birds out. You have to let everything out. Take everything out of the building before you demolish it. So there is a degree where uh, we're, we're, we use nature. Nature's create, these animals are created for us to utilize, but we can't abuse them at the same time. So uh, their way of living to me was one of the amazing ways, uh, phenomenon of history. Is IVF permissible? I've never seen that it's forbidden. If it is from the husband and the wife's, uh, I haven't seen that that's from forbidden. How does one handle the problems caused by their sins back when they were not close to the dean? Well, this happens all the time. A person enters the dean because of what they did in the past, they got a lot of issues with Iman and doing the right thing and following the Sharia. And you will over eventually over time straighten out everything in the past. All right. So you may have relationships with friends who are astray and they enjoy doing certain things. All those things are haram. You can't do them anymore. So what do you do? Uh, that's a problem. You cause that problem by being astray. Now that you straighten out, Allah will show you a way out of it. And you work at it one thing at a time. All right, right. what do you got? Saying Alhamdulillah after sneezing during Salah. No, but Sabih. Say it's Zikrillah. It doesn't break your Salah. Because it was mentioned that now you're obliging another person to say, Ya Rahmakullah. No, no, they should not do that because they can't speak to you. Technically, if they would have, if the person next to you would have said, Allahumma Rahmahu, that's acceptable because that's a dua for him. But you're speaking to Allah. You cannot speak to another person in, out, while you're in the salah. As Nika C says, is it sinful to give the evil eye to someone without intending to do so? Anything that you do unintentionally is not sinful. Uh, Abi Khan is asking about Yut. Yut, if I'm pronouncing it properly, is the tribe that Yasin said they derive from. What, what constitutes spying on people in the Quran? What if it's something people posted themselves on social media? Very good question. Spying is to look in a place that is not 
your business that is locked out. You are supposed to be out of it, such as unlocking someone's phone and looking at it, going into someone's drawers and looking, moving around their house and looking at what they had intended to keep private. But if they had made it public, it's not spying at all. So if I go and look at someone's Instagram page to see what they're up to, how is that spying? They put it in public. Good. Abby Khan says that, or Abby Kim says that, not the Native Americans in Central and South America, the Spaniards colonized the Aztecs. Yeah, the Aztecs were a bit different, I think. They had, like, kings and government, very different from the American Native Americans. In the north, they were nomad tribes, like the Apache. They gave the Aztecs and Spaniards problems when they tried to get more uh, lines up north since their armies were effective against their organized armies. So a little bit of Native American history there. Dino says, can being buried next to a righteous person help you in the barzakh? I saw a narration by Ibn al-Jawzi which says that a woman buried next to Imam Ahmed was covered by his blessings. I believe it is possible because I do believe that it is possible to still make dua after death. And I would, we know that the people buried in the same graveyards recognize one another. They see one another. And it is, is it possible for them to make dua in the akhirah? Allahu alam. But I would assume that it is very hard to believe that a righteous person who prays and makes dua to Allah and has a connection to Allah in this hayat dunya, when he goes to the barzakh, do you think his connection with Allah is a shot? Is over? Of course he still has a greater connection to Allah Ta'ala. So could he use that connection to help someone? Allahu Adam. But in it's in which book? It's in the opening of the hearts that, that, that narrations like that, things happen. Yes. I would not be surprised at all. I believe it, but I have to. I can't say it without having a, a direct proof. Who would be held accountable on the day of judgment for a sin or an action that is impermissible, but it was done in accordance with taqlid or the opinion of a scholar? The, if the common Muslim follows a fatwa of his local imam, that common Muslim is innocent of having committed sins. He did not commit sins because he followed the fatwa of the local imam. However, if the fatwa is incorrect, then that person will suffer the worldly consequences of that fatwa. So let's say, for example, you follow, I'm a common Muslim, I don't know any better. The local imam says, don't eat any meat you want, McDonald's, supermarket, say bismillah and eat. And music is halal as long as there's no cursing or sexuality or words that are forbidden. So now you have a whole family, they don't eat halal and they listen to music all day. So the guy innocently says, hey, I'm just following my local imam. He said it's halal. What, who, who am I to talk? All right? So he may be not guilty in front of Allah because he didn't intentionally disobey Allah. Okay? Even if someone says, no, no, the fatwa is wrong, he doesn't know how to measure a fatwa being right or wrong. So that matter is clouded for him. So he's not intentionally disobeying Allah. However, you have a family now that doesn't eat halal and listen to music all day, right? Do you think now you're going to have the same barakah in your life, the same benefit in your life as a family that eats halal and does not listen to these instruments and recites the Qur'an? Show me one household in which music and the hifz of Qur'an come together. It's the only answer about when it comes to musical instrumentation and the discussion about it. I just answer with one thing. Do you care about having the Qur'an being part of your life? As a Muslim, show me a household in which these two things come together. You got three huffaz, they also play the flute. Or they also listen to music all the time. I'm not saying that you, you, you can't control your ear. You walk around the supermarket, you go to different stores, you will hear stuff over and over and over. You're not responsible for that. You're responsible for what you do intentionally. So that's the answer to that question. If an engaged man cheats and lies in a haram relationship, does that add to the punishment of the haram relationship? So he has he has a girlfriend, yet cheats on that girlfriend. Now he has two sins, because both are sinful. 
So the answer is yes, it does increase. It, no, it's not cheating, right? It's cheating in that world which we don't recognize, right? It's cheating in an, uh, a secular understanding of relationships which we don't recognize, okay? So um, this is like thieves when they steal from one another. Is it stealing? If me and uh, Ryan robbed a bank and I said, hey, it's all 50-50 and then I actually told, stole from his bag, did I steal from him? Stealing from a thief? Uh, the quality of sinfulness of cheating will grow inside me, but that act, all of it's haram. The stealing and the acquiring of the money in the first place. Okay. How often does one do tawassul, says Dino, all the time, any time that we want to draw near to Allah, we must bring a good deed. Okay. A love of the Prophet is one of the best deeds you're going to bring. Why? Because that's the root of all your other good deeds. Bir al-Walidayn is a great deed. Tasbih and dhikr is a great deed. Right. Dua with intensity is a great deed. You must offer something to Allah if you want to get something back. And firstly, Allah gives us with before we, we offer and without offering. And He gives us more when we offer. But we are commanded, ibtaghu ilayhi al-wasila in the Quran. Seek the means to Him. Okay? So we are going to seek the means to Allah by offering something. Some act of ibadah. A busy person who sits down, takes time out of his schedule to do ibadah, it's far, that ibadah is worth more than, let's say, a student who has all the time in the world and no responsibilities. The student who has all the time in the world, no responsibilities, the community needs that type of person. We need your help. We need your manpower. Okay. So people who are working all the time, for them to take time out and do ibadah or get up to do tahajjud, etc., etc., it's worth more all right so you have to offer some deed whether that deed be loving for example i think one of the best deeds is when we read the stories of the awliya and we revive the dhikr the mention of some of these greats it's important for us to do that in history law of attraction a question from bilal saqibi no as, as i've said earlier my philosophy on that is very simple all, what they have tapped into in these things are three basic things. The importance of belief, confidence, and the practice of focus. These are the three key things that are worldly traits. Anybody could have this. Kafir, a Muslim, right? So it's belief. Belief in things that you can't see. We should be the best at that. What is the first attribute of a Muslim? Yu'minuna bil ghayb, a mu'min in Surah Al-Baqarah. Right? We believe in things far greater than you being successful. You being a millionaire is the least of what we believe in. I mean, that's so easy for Allah Ta'ala. We believe in far greater things. Okay? So we, we are people who believe in some great unseen. So for someone to say, believe in the unseen of 20 years from now, you being successful, or five years from now, that's easy to believe. So we have no problem with belief. And the more ibadah that we do, the stronger we become believers. We no longer are limited to the fact that, hey, how am I going to be successful when all I have is these little things in front, these small group, set of skills and the small amount of money? Don't worry about that. If Allah wants it to happen, it's going to happen. So you have to do ibadah to, to have iman, belief. The second thing is confidence. Allah uh, himself has created a willpower inside you. He didn't create a willpower so you don't use it. We have to use it. And our confidence, though, is not is connected to belief. Your self-confidence is not in yourself. It's your confidence in Allah Ta'ala. If you have self-confidence, then you're going to be very limited. Because your eyes will see that you have limitations. You can't deny that. But if your strength comes from Allah's support, إِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ Prophet Sallallahu said, if you make a decision, rely on Allah now. So we believe that it is Allah who will deliver us, not ourselves. Okay. Third thing is focus. Focus is very important and a lot of people get distracted very easily. So they start a project, they never finish it. And that's a problem. Or they start and as soon as the going gets tough, they just give it up. Focus is to stick to one thing 
and repeat it. When you repeat something, you don't have to be that bright. You will get really good at it. No matter how bright or dumb you are, you will get really, really good at it. Okay. I went to Connecticut. I saw a restaurant. I don't even know what it was called. It's called like uh, Shabazz Restaurant or something. It was a Desi owned place that just sells shawarma sandwiches. Chicken shawarma, lamb, is it gyro or gyro? Lamb gyro, lettuce, white sauce, and a refrigerator with some drinks. And the branding was very simple, red, white, and black. That was it, right? We get there, we eat food that is not memorable, but it wasn't bad. It was fine, right? And you left. But I asked about the business. This guy... He went nine years having one store. Buying the shawarma, cutting it up, putting it out there, hiring the workers. Nine years. It took him nine years to save up money. He opened a second store. Trained a manager. After two years, opened a third store. After now one year, opened a fourth store. And then the next year after that, he opened three in one year. The guy has like 10 stores, 10 restaurants. And he just sits back and makes sure they're all staffed, everything is going well. He owns 10 stores. Okay. What is he doing? He's doing nothing. Other, there's nothing special about the business. That's what I love. There's nothing special. What he did is he offered a service in a place that there were Muslims, he offered halal food. Was it fireworks? No. Was it bad? No. It was fine. So he offered a very simple service, but he did it so often, he figured out how to make it simple and replicable, and he replicated it. And now he's a very rich man who owns like 10 or 15 of these restaurants. So to me, it's just simple. If if you know where you want to go, you're going to get there. If you have direction and focus, you're going to arrive at your destination. You don't have to be have any skills different from anybody else. That's what I love about this kind of story. It's because this is not a story that nobody can repeat. Anybody could do this. But keep in mind, I think he had the same restaurant for like nine years. One restaurant. That's a long time. Every day, you're going to work, going to work. Six years have passed, nothing changed. But he, he was getting better without even realizing it. So I like that. Uh, that that kind of person who just um, persists upon something until he grows and grows, and then you eventually, if you stick to it, it goes through the roof. All right, now listen up here to Qamarun. How is a girl to balance the responsibilities and culture of modern-day living? I have a job. I go to uni. I go with my friends. But I still abide by the command of staying at home, being modest, and not being seen by men. Well, there is a degree of that it is possible that you uh, will do, you will not fulfill the staying at home fully because clearly you're going to school, but you don't interact with guys without a need. That's the solution. I think there are a lot of women, they go to school and they just have a, a, a group of friends that are girls. All the guys have a group of friends that are guys. And they don't mingle. They don't text back and forth. Okay, I've seen this on the girl's side and the guy's side. It's doable. They go to classes, they lower their gaze. They walk around, they lower their gaze. They go out and do whatever youth do to have fun together. Not mingling. They have a job, they don't mingle at the job. That's the way you have to do it. It's your gaze and your speech, right? Your gaze, your speech, your cell phone, all that. That's what you're looking at. I hope that answers the question. Women and men must must lower their gaze. Both, women and men. How do, Sophia says, how does one know he got sick from Ayn? What are the symptoms? I think that the only thing I know is that sickness of Ayn is something where physicians can't necessarily figure out what's wrong with you. 
That's the only thing that I heard, and I'm not an expert on this, but I did hear that. You know someone who said that, because there was like, it's a long story. Yeah. A very short part of it was that he said it felt like his brain was in this person's mouth. Oh my God. That sounds like voodoo. Just like, like numbing, like chewing on it. That's voodoo. Yeah, they, they, that's voodoo. That stuff exists. May Allah protect us. I don't want to know about this stuff. Okay. Rai, read me something from YouTube. What is Hizb al-Bahr? Hizb al-Bahr. It's a prayer litany authored by Abu al-Hassan al-Shadli of Morocco. He authored it in Egypt on his way to Hajj when the ship was going to be uh, flipped. And they thought they were going to die. So he saw the Prophet in a vision, in a dream. And the Prophet, according to this, the narration of uh, Abu al-Hassan al-Shadli, uh, Abu Hassan al Shadili, the Prophet recited to him this prayer. He said, Say this, and he recited it to him. When he woke up, he recited it out loud on the deck, and the, the ocean stayed still. The sea calmed down. They arrived at Hajj, and then Abu Hassan al Shadili died shortly thereafter. That. But that's the story of Hizb al Bahr. As Nika says, My great uncle cut ties with my aunts. And my mother. I don't know him well. And he lives very far. Is it an obligation for me to visit him? The obligation of those distant relatives is, is not a burdensome obligation. If he's far, you're not obligated. If you want to pick up the phone, you can pick up the phone. But you have no obligation to go to his house. Bilal Saqbi. How can I overcome fear of public speaking? Watch public speakers and... Until you like what you see, if you like what you see from public speakers, you'll want to be good at it. All right, right. Give me something from YouTube. Is it frowned upon if you're in a gathering to stand up and greet someone when they enter? Is it frowned upon to stand up if they are a respected person, such as a father or an elder? It's not frowned upon because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Sa'ad walked in, he said, Qumu li Sayyidikum. So when the Prophet said, Don't do this for me, he wanted to make sure that the Ummah does not take on the Persian habits. But if it's just out of respect, it is permitted. Qamarun says, Some people say we should leave uni or work in general due to the fitan of today. If there is fitan, then yeah, you would leave them. If there's fitan and then your sister's having some problems. Yes, you could leave them. You're not obligated to go to do these things in the first place. Ali Raghib says, Thank you for pointing out that communication between opposite sex is okay if it is necessary. As a nurse, I always have to talk to the opposite sex. Yes, you do. So if there is a, a need in your workplace, then you, as long as you don't have any desire in shahwa, inshallah you won't be counted sin, as sinful for that. My friend and I noticed we're doing things out of gratitude to Allah and we make dua, but the situation keeps getting worse. Is this a test of our perseverance? Yes, it must be a test or maybe something else is wrong. Maybe something is wrong in your actions because your spiritual state with Allah is one thing. But maybe the actions, maybe the situation has something wrong in it. So you have to examine that too. All right, let's go to Rai. What you got from uh, YouTube? Big mushkila right here. Big mushkila. What's going on? Is it permissible to donate blood or host a blood drive? If there is a darura, a need for blood, then a darurat to be al mahdurat. Same r- ruling as organ donation. If there is a darura and a need for people to survive or their life is severely altered? And the answer is yes, out of, as a fatwa. Next question. Is it okay to do a full prayer on the Prophet once and follow it by sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the rest of yes. the day? Yes, you may do that. Next question. Business halal if you sell without the laws of the land authorizing or giving you a permit. 
uh, the rizq will be halal, but if you get caught, your du'a might not be answered because you did go against the law. For example, uh, selling raw milk in New Jersey is not allowed. If I go to Pennsylvania, buy a bunch of raw milk, freshly squeezed out of the udder or freshly milked out of the cow, and I come here and sell it to my friends, it's technically illegal. If I get caught, who's to say my du'a will be answered? I did not fear Allah in that situation. So, whoever fears Allah, Allah finds a way out for him. But Ibn Abbas says to someone, he said, you didn't fear Allah, so there's no way out for you. You're stuck. So, that your punishment for that will be the worldly consequences. It's like, what's the ruling on running a red light when no one's around? Makruh at best. Because if you get caught, the punishment is, you get a ticket. You're not going to come on Yom Al-Qiyamah and be found guilty. You didn't break one of Allah's laws. You just broke a, a local law that you're supposed to agree to. Right? It's binding upon you. Same thing. So I think that the rizq will be halal, but I think that you are on shaky grounds because if you get caught, don't come crying to Allah now. Because you knew that you were doing something wrong. So that's your punishment. Your punishment is that you can be subjected to the fines and the taxes and the, maybe even prison. Adino says, Ibn Walid is asking on YouTube, can you give us some scholars on YouTube with lectures in classical Arabic? Go to the lectures of Sheikh Saeed Ramadan al Bulti. You'll learn a lot. He uses very nice language, simple language, and there's a ton of such videos. Saeed Ramadan al Bulti, I believe... I love listening to him. Um, he has clips, and I learn a lot. Yasin Archuleta, what is the best way to bring Muslim communities together that are divided? Uh, the best way to do it is to find what they agree upon, no matter how minor it is. Even if it is of the dunya. Like eating. I think everyone likes to eat out, right? Go to a halal restaurant or something. Food. So you find the, the lowest, and no matter how long you stay there, and don't ever go up to what they dif differ upon. Just stay at what they agree on. Once the hearts change, they will not want to differ on other things. Uh, that's my uh, f view of it. If there, you go to the least common denominator, and you keep harping on that least common, it may take you years, but eventually once the hearts come together, they will not want to be differing on the bigger things. So they'll find a way to understand your perspective, etc. And Allah knows best. Is it haram to disclose sins to a psychologist? It is permitted to disclose your actions to someone, even if it's sinful, if there is some help to be gained. Uh, daydreams of Autumn. Does Safina offer Hanafi fit class and Aqidah for non-Americans? Yes. Yes, you can take them. The Hanafi fit class will be very will be at 10 p.m. No, the Hanafi fit is at 7 p.m. Hanbali is at 6 p.m. The Hanbali one is at 6 p.m. Hmm? Han Hanbali fit is on Thursday. Hanafi fit on Arcview is on Monday. 7 p.m. So that's going to be a bit late for the Britishers, but they can catch up with the recordings. Aqidah will be one p will be 12 noon eastern standard time which will be perfectly fine for the britishers introduction to aqidah sunday the introductory mutun with sheikh murad you can take those um that'll be probably like 7 p.m on sunday for the for the english the british do you recommend sheikh saeed al kamali his stories are excellent, but his fiqh is not necessarily Maliki fiqh. It's mingled between, I think, a little bit of uh, uh, his, his studies with, I think he studied with Bimbez. And likewise in Aqidah, it's a, I don't know, it's a mix. I get two different vibes from him, two different opinions, not vibes, actually what he says. But his stories are amazing. When he tells you the history of a chain of transmission or a history of a Sahabi, he's brilliant. But when it comes to actually reflecting purely the Maliki Madhab, then no. It does not purely reflect the Maliki Madhab, uh, neither in its fiqh or aqidah. Yeah, there is this movement that has merged between studying in Saudi and being Maliki. 
I'm not a fan of that merging. There's, there's actually a good shayukh there, though, right? The Al Mubarak family? In Saudi, yeah, in East Arabic, uh, East Saudi, in Al Ahsa. Those lectures are excellent. If you're a, if Arabic speaker, Google it up, Al Madrasa Al Malikiyya Bil Ahsa, in Arabic. The Sheikh, his name is Abdul, Hal, Abdul Hamid Al Mubarak. Listen to his lectures in Maliki Fiqh, you will learn a ton. Again, his name is Abdul Hamid Al Mubarak. Old chain of transmission in East Saudi. If you are a student of Maliki Fiqh, the YouTube channel is called Al Madrasa Al Malikiyya Bil Ahsa. How do you choose a specific madhab? Ijtihadul Ammi, the Ijtihad of the common Muslim is to judge who is best, most worthy to follow. Men huwa al bahth an men huwa awla bit taqlid, awal ittiba. What's the difference between taqlid and ittiba? Taqlid is imitation, ittiba is followership. Taqlid means, just give me the ruling, I don't have time for any discussions. Just tell me halal or haram. That's taqlid. You're allowed to do that except for aqidah. You must know belief for yourself. You don't not need to be able to author proofs, but you cannot say, why did you believe in the Prophet? Someone says, oh, because, well, the Sheikh said, we have to believe in the Prophet. No, you can't say that. Your belief in Allah and His Messenger must be genuine from yourself. Whether you know how to author proofs or not, that doesn't make a difference. But you must, that must be from yourself. Everything else you're not obligated to know the evidences. So local imam tells you, it's halal, I'll do it. That is allowed. Is it, is it virtuous? No, it's not virtuous. What is ittiba? Ittiba is when you study the evidences. Now, I can't derive the evidences, but I can study why a shafi said this, why did the Hanafi say that, why did the uh, Ash'ari Aqidah say this. I can study that and understand it. That's called ittiba. Now I follow it. Okay. The common Muslims, his ijtihad, his intellectual effort, is the study of who is most worthy of following. And then you study with that person. Everyone does that. When you uh, scan YouTube and you choose to listen to one scholar over another, that's an ijtihad that you made. Right? Because one looked or felt or sounded more worthy of your time and followership than another. So that's Qadi, uh, it was um, Qadi Ayyad in his famous book, Tartib al Madarik, has an excellent chapter on this in which he says the imitation, the, the ijtihad of the common Muslim is to see who they should follow. Who should I be a student for? Should I be a student of so and so or so and so? That's your effort. You have to study. I would recommend people read the biographies of the four imams. Learn their madhahib. Learn what is Ash'ari or Maturidi Aqidah. This is the madhahib, the Aqidah of more than 75% of the Ummah. All the Ahnaf, they followed Abu Mansur al-Maturidi's categorization of Aqidah. The Shafi'iyya and Malikiyya followed Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari. All of the four madhabs, right, amongst them, they read Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, in the matter of purification of the heart. All four methods read for him. Okay. They read uh, Abdul Qadr al-Jailani, all of them. So you should study these things. And what is our job here in this live stream? To take the common Muslim, answer his questions, teach him a thing or two about the deen, but also encourage you to become students of knowledge. And that's the whole point of Arc View, basic. $10 a month, you take courses now, right? $10 a month. It's essentially free. I have teachers tell me, well, what is this $10 a month? This should be $50 a month. And the scholarship track should be $250 a month. So my, what is our purpose here, right? What's our goal? It should be a no-brainer to take these courses for $10 a month. Well, I'm not kidding you. I, I had a teacher, he said, I can't believe what you're doing. Right, I said, I want people to take the classes. It should be a no-brainer for everybody. We need a thick middle class who understand what their deen is. I can't, you can't have Sheikh Murad's class on Aqidah and not take it. 
got to take this class. Sundays, 12 o'clock to 12.45. 45 minutes of your time. You put on the iPad or the phone, you don't have to show up. You don't have to do anything. The class comes right to you and you could unmute yourself and talk. Okay. So I highly recommend everyone do, uh, does that. Is it okay to be a street vendor in New York City? The permit seems to be more expensive than the profit. They only succeed when they have multiple trucks because the permits are pretty expensive. And the Egyptians have taken up all the permits, by the way. And by the way, when you go there, ask if it is halal. Don't go by the sign because some of them are known to be liars. I'm telling you from direct experience, kathabin. And some of them are honest, right? Some of them, they will take the package of meat right out in front of you and you see it's halal. Others, the attendant will tell you, no, it's not halal. Well, there's a sign that says halal. He says, no, that's the name of the store. It's not, we're not claiming it's halal. That's the name of our restaurant or of our grease truck. How can I become a student in a physical class of Mufti Taqi Usmani? No clue. Nasir al-Amriki, you should have Sheikh Yusuf Sadiq al hambari on again. Yes, we, I have something special coming for you. Recordings. Pre-recorded course. What is the Hanbali Aqidah? Pre-recorded course that is forthcoming, part of Arcview Basic for Sheikh Yusuf Ibn Sadiq. Do we specifically have to ask if the meat is zabiha when eating out in the States? Yes, you do. When you eat at a restaurant, you must confirm that. All right, one last question, Ryan, before we go to our du'a. It is Wednesday. Remember, Sa'at al Ijab is special on Wednesday. How to decide between a current career where one does deem obligations are made easy and the other option is a higher future earning potential but unsure of the ease in salawats and jummah and everything. No, you, as long as you can pray jummah, that's a fard upon you. You have to make sure you can pray Juma, but the Prophet said, you're not just benefiting yourself when you take a higher earning job. You're, you're, you're benefiting your family. You have to view it like that. You're benefiting your kids. You're able to afford more for them. You think that Quran classes are free? Soccer practice is free? Uh, a big house? So your wife could get peace of mind? Your kids could have everything they need in the house rather than leaving the house because it's so cramped. You, I would say you go for what benefits you in your in this hayat dunya with the intention that it's sadaqah for them and you will you will find a way to do your nawafil, to continue your nafila, your your ibadah which is a nafila. For example, your ibadah that is for example um, if, as you said, I do dhikr, well, everyone has 15 minutes a day. Even the President of the United States can find 15 minutes out of a day. Uh, oh, they're obligatory prayers. I saw. I see. So you have to uh, make sure that before you take a job, you're able to fulfill your obligatory prayers. That is something you are bound to by the sharia. I thought he meant his extra dhikr that he does. No, you have to, uh, to make sure that first, and then you can take that job. All right, we begin our adhkar. We're going to recite Hizb al-Nasr, written by Imam al-Haddad, and then we're going to make dua because Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr is Sa'at al-Ijaba. There is a time between Dhuhr and Asr on Wednesday in which the gates of the heaven open up in a way unlike any other time. According to Jabir ibn Abdullah, the Prophet wasallam received an answer from the heavens on a Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr when he was making dua at the Battle of Khandaq. He said, I then, anytime I had a need, I would pray on Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr and I would see a sign of ijabah. And many, many, many people, it doesn't mean you're going to receive what you want right away, but you will get a sign that your dua has been answered. And many people have testified to this. So it's what we call mujarrab, tried and tested. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما 
وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا وكان عند الله وجيها وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين وجهت وجهي للذي فطر السماوات والأرض بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم أعيذ نفسي بالله تعالى من كل ما يسمع بأذنين ويبصر بعينين ويمشي برجلين ويبطش بيدين ويتكلم بشفتين حصنت نفسي بالله الخالق الأكبر من شر ما أخاف وأحذر من الجن والإنس وأن يحضرون عز جاره وجل ثناؤه وتقدست أسماؤه ولا إله غيره اللهم إني أجعلك في نحور آدائي وأعوذ بك من شرورهم وتحيلهم ومكرهم ومكائدهم أطفئ نار من أراد بعداوة من الجن والإنس يا حافظ يا حفيظ يا كافي يا محيط سبحانك يا رب ما أعظم شأنك وأعز سلطانك تحسنت بالله وبأسماء الله وبآيات الله وملائكة الله وأنبياء الله ورسل الله والصالحين من عباد الله حصنت نفسي بلا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم احرسني بعينك التي لا تنام واكنفني بكنفك الذي لا يرام وارحمني بقدرتك علي فلا أهلك وأنت ثقتي ورجائي يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين يا درك الهالكين يا درك الهالكين يا درك الهالكين اكفني شر كل طارق يطرق بليل أو نهار إلا طارق يطرق بخير إنك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله أرقي نفسي من كل ما يؤذي ومن كل حاسد الله شفائي بسم الله رقيت اللهم رب الناس أذهب الباس اشفي أنت الشافي وعافي أنت المعافي لا شفاء إلا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر السقم ولا ألم يا كافي يا وافي يا حميد يا مجيد ارفع عني كل تعب شديد واكفني من الهدي والحديد والمرض الشديد والجيش العديد واجعل لي نورا من نورك وعز من عزك ونصرا من نصرك وبهاء من بهائك وعطاء من عطائك وحراسة من حراستك وتأييد من تأييدك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام والمواهب العظام أسألك أن تكفيني من شر كل ذي شر إنك أنت الله الخالق الأكبر وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والحمد لله رب العالمين ظاهرا وباطنا وعلى كل حال يا أرحم الراحمين إن شاء الله we'll pause here and we will all do an individual uh, dua in the for a few minutes
صلى الله وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين <تصفيق> Oh, my God.